after a bitter 36-year civil war. Is reconciliation possible in Sri Lanka? I'm Arun Naidu at the Sri Lankan Embassy in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. The United Nations estimates that as many as 40,000 people were killed in the final phase of a war between Sri Lanka's majority Sinhalese and the Tamil minority. Another 5,000 are reported missing. The hostilities finally came to an end seven years ago when government forces overtook the last area controlled by the Tamil Tiger rebels. Fast forward to the 2015 election when amid charges of corruption, human rights abuses and growing authoritarianism, Former Sri Lankan President Mahinda Rajapaksa lost his bid for a third term in a stunning upset. The winner, former Health Minister Maitripala Sirisena, has pledged to persuade his Sinhalese followers to support a new constitution that shares some central government powers with minorities. But considering the lingering animosity between the Tamils and majority Sinhalese, the question is, after a quarter century of conflict, can true reconciliation be achieved? Joining us now is the Sri Lankan ambassador to the United States, Prasad Kariyawasam. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Let me start by posing that question that we did at the outset of the show, and that is, is reconciliation possible in Sri Lanka? Right now, your government is proposing changes to the country's constitution, which would give certain powers, some powers, to the country's minority Tamil group. What kinds of changes are you talking about? Well, first, reconciliation is eminently possible for several reasons. We, uh, Sri Lanka, went through a 30-year conflict, and that ended in 2009. And people of north, south, east, west of the country all welcome that there is no more violence in the country. They were seeking a peace dividend in terms of both social justice and development. The government then, of course, did the work on development. They did the rehabilitation, resettlement of, um, of IDPs, reconstruction. They did all that. Although the reconciliation part was somewhat missing. And as a result, in 2015, a new government was elected, a monumental change, a paradigm shift. And that government's policies, reconciliation and development together. And in last year, August, they set up, for the first time in our history, a unity government comprising of both major opposing parties. UNP, of, led by Prime Minister Vikramasinghe, and the SLFP, led by President Sirisena, both got together and formed one government. And that government, of course, now opposition is the Tamil National Alliance. Now, all three, these three formations are working Does together. Does it include members of the Tamil Alliance, this government? Uh, TNA is in the opposition. Tamil National Alliance is the main opposition party. But all, now if you take the government budget, budget was passed by the support of the opposition as well. So two-thirds majority was there for the budget. So for, for reconciliation process to move on, you need two-thirds majority in the parliament for sure because reconciliation includes a peace dividend in terms of development, in terms of justice, dignity for people, and with regard to the devolution, sharing of powers with the region and communities. Now, when you, when you try to say minorities in Sri Lanka is not only Tamils, we are a Muslim groups. 10 nearly 10% of our population is now Muslim, and 12% is Tamil. So therefore, it's a equal, we, we need to have device constitutional mechanisms that will empower people in the regions. So what are these constitutional amendments that the government is proposing? Government has already done one amendment, 19th amendment, as soon as they were elected. That included setting up independent commissions on each and every important governance aspects for public service, for justice, for police, all now set, and then the, and the, and then the judiciary was made totally independent. That is set. Now the parliament has been made a constitutional assembly. The uh, uh, idea is to create a constitution f that will suit this century and take care of the reconciliation aspect as well, which means 
sharing of power, devolution of power, both at the center and the region. Now the government is working on it. Government has done, uh, unlike last time, government has done something very smart. Those days, all the constitution, 72 constitution, 78 constitution, were all top down. This government is making it bottom up by appointing public consultation process for constitutional reform. That has happened and they have come up with a set of uh, recommendations with public view. So they have, a, they have a document in hand that describes what public needs. And on that basis, a committee has been, steering committee of 21 people have been appointed and they are going to look at all the critical issues that requires all Right, change. these amendments are currently stalled in committee. When can we expect them to be implemented? They are not stalled. Committee, committees are discussing these issues. By December, government expects to have a draft, and then uh, government should muster, the muster two-third majority and then go to a referendum. So that is the plan of the government. Nothing has been told. Everything is moving smoothly in our perspective. There has been a report which was released by the International Crisis Group, which is a very respected group that uh, uh, concerns international affairs at the beginning of last month and that report says that pledges by the Sri Lankan president to bring about reconciliation and accountability remain largely unaddressed. What is the government doing to address that? We don't share that view because uh, if you ask uh, our international partners, they would not say that. They have in fact said something to the contrary, that within a year Sri Lanka has achieved a lot of uh, promises. Yes, we have, we have a plan of action. We are sequencing the achievements to, to make it work. If you, if you, we, need to be, we need to be mindful. Fast is not always success. You need to have a broad-based approach to bring everyone together so that whatever we set up will become a successful model that will stand the test of time. For instance, we just gasseted the parliament to approve Office of Missing Persons. And that's the most important uh, element in our country because we have missing, missing persons coming from two insurgencies in the south and one in the north. So we are going to address that very seriously. And then Tamil National Alliance has agreed with that, uh, that, that draft. Right, but one of the complaints against that Office of Missing Persons, which you've established, is that you're not talking to the families of the people missing. Which is, uh, unfortunately, that is not true because we have done that. Uh, that's only, it's, these are speculate, speculations. Well, it's Human Rights Watch, which is also respected. Human and, we Rights Watch. And, and we have responded to that. We have responded to that, and then, uh, and we have responded with statistics how we had done the consultations. So, on the one hand, people are asking us to do fast. On the other hand, when we do it fast, they complain. When we, when we, uh, when we keep consulting, they say we have not done anything. Of course, that's the way the world works. Uh, but we did this fast, having a quick consultation. So now. Now uh, we are being blamed for that. So we are, we are sequencing these things. Right. Now in the interests of reconciliation, of accountability, the Sri Lankan government has agreed to a UN Human Rights Council resolution which uh, mandates, and I'm quoting here, the creation of various transitional justice mechanisms including an accountability mechanism for war crimes. Your government says that it's embarked on a national consultation which you've just talked about a moment ago and said that it would report to the Human Rights Council this month. What is the status of that report? No, that's not the way it is. Actually, High Commissioner for Human Rights will have to report to the Council as to how Sri Lanka has, has implemented right. the resolution. High Commissioner will do that. Of course, our minister will be there and we will all say what we have done. But, our, we, uh, but then we have until next March to come up with our own, own, own achievement report. So, uh, but we think we have done well. We, we have not, uh, we have not um, missed a single step that what we have promised in the resolution. But what could you tell me about the establishment of these transitional justice mechanisms that the council calls for? We have now established missing persons office, that's one. Right. Then we have, to, we, have, we have to have, we are working with the UN. We have invited all the special rapporteurs of, of the UN involved in issues that are relevant to Sri Lanka to work with us. So they are already, in, ex, international experts are working with Sri Lanka. And we have now finished the missing persons. 
we have to then look at the truth seeking mechanism we'll have to look at justice mechanism those consultations are taking place under a task force for consultation comprising of civil society leaders who are now at that and in addition we have also commenced a web based consultative process for international community anyone to give us us, us ideas so we will then take we will go into that at 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 some point now, as you are aware, there have been serious allegations made against the Sri Lankan armed forces as well as the Tamil rebels as well. But I want to ask you about these allegations made against the Sri Lankan armed forces. A government appointed judge said that these allegations are, to use his words, credible. The UN has also released a report. Is your government open to an international investigation? Government is, is, is open to having a domestic investigative mechanism with international support. That is what we promised to the UN, U, uh, UN and that's what we are going to do. So this international support that you talk about, would these include international judges, prosecutors and investigators? That will be, de that will be decided by the cons once the consultation process is over. At the moment we are doing consultations as to what's the best mechanism, but it will be a domestic mechanism, not international mechanism, domestic uh, mechanism strengthened by the participation of international experts. How does your country move forward from this civil war? We have moved very well. We have with 30 years of conflict within one year, we have undone a lot. If you look at the set of achievements Sri Lanka has done, it's monumental. I'll give you one simple example. We just ratified the Convention Against Enforced Disappearances. Not many countries, not even US or many Western countries haven't done that. We are, the, we are one of the very few countries in the world who has ratified all the core human rights convention now. So we have taken paradigm shift with regard to that. In fact, my minister was in Oslo last week, chair, uh, be the key speaker of abolition of death penalty in the world. We, we take lead in human rights issues. Now we, have, we, are, we are on a path, not only on reconciliation, on a path of human rights, path of humanitarian promotion, both locally and internationally. Right, you say you've made great progress is the Sri Lankan government talking to Tamil leaders in the country, not just political leaders, but the people who are affected by this war? Of course, yes. Of course, yes. President himself does that. He, he visits Jaffna often. He goes to uh, Trincomalee often. That's the Meet. Northern Territory where the Yes, war. of course. Uh, and and he's, he's welcomed there like a hero by the public. That's the, that's the good side of it. In fact, uh, just the other day, President uh, Sirisena and Prime Minister Modi jointly open a stadium in Jaffna, a reconstructed stadium, Duryapa Stadium. So that's, a, that's something that the, there are initiatives like that, that are happening in the country. And, uh, and there is travel is free in the country. There is no violence anywhere. Anyone can go. Visas are uh, um, given for any, 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 any party to go, even Channel 4. Everybody can go. There is no, no bar on, uh, on any travel or, or me, no media, media censorship, nothing. In this process of reconciliation, how important is accountability to your government? Because in many respects, are we going to see uh, people being brought to justice? That is the intention of the government because uh, they, will, they, will have, they will have truth seeking mechanisms first, which will, which will, uh, which will give room to assess with how to, how to craft the justice mechanism in a manner that anyone, anyone who is accused of wrongdoing has to face justice. What are your country's priorities right now? Give a peace dividend to people who have suffered for 30 years, both in the north, south and east. And we need to give that to people quickly. For that, we have to promote both reconciliation and development. Development is very important because, for instance, northern province are lagging behind. There is lot of support. There is lot of needs for livelihood support for people. So we appeal for international community and the friends to support those those initiatives, uh, because we need to take them up, and that is our priority at this point. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. We are going to take a break right now. We'll be back in the studio with more on reconciliation in Sri Lanka. Right after that, stay with us. You're watching the Heat. Welcome back. We're talking about the possibility of reconciliation in Sri Lanka after a bitter 36-year civil war. Joining us now from Raleigh, North Carolina, is the Vice President of the United States Tamil Political Action Council, Elias Jayaraja. Elias, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. 
We just talked with the Sri Lankan ambassador to the United States. He says the country is making good progress on reconciliation after this very bitter war. The government is now considering constitutional amendments which would give the Tamils uh, powers and a say in their own affairs. What do you make of that? Um, I acknowledge that um, since the formation of this current government that was overwhelmingly voted uh, for by the Tamils and other minorities, uh, there is a, a change uh, in, in mood and there is uh, um, at least the, the, um, there is less oppressive conditions in the Tamil areas and also generally in Sri Lanka. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the areas of conflict in the northeast, uh, they are still under heavy militarization. There are some 17 out of the 21 divisions of the military still placed in the Tamil areas, uh, even seven years after the end of the war. Uh, and uh, it is putting a, a stress on the um, local community there. And uh, there are existential difficulties due to that. Uh, and on top of that, um, uh, um, there was, uh, with the help of the U.S. governments, there were successive resolutions brought at the U.N. Human Rights Council. Uh, and uh, last year in September, uh, this resolution 31 was passed uh, uh, as a consensus resolution with the Sri Lankan government. And this consensus resolution obliges Sri Lanka to uh, create, uh, to start a transitional justice process and uh, that has uh, several aspects to that including a creation of a special counsel's office, uh, a truth uh, and reconciliation commission, a reparations uh, office and also an office for missing persons. Okay, just one point uh, on the, uh, you say that there is continued militarization in the northern part of the country, in the peninsula where the fighting took place. Um, yes. Has there been any kind of reconstruction that's taken place there uh, since the war ended seven years ago? Uh, there has been reconstruction uh, happening in terms of uh, putting uh, major roads, etc. This happened, this started with the previous government itself. Uh, and uh, people uh, have, uh, are starting to rebuild and repair their war damaged houses, you know, if they can right. afford to do that on their own. But uh, 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 concerted government sponsored reconstruction efforts among the war affected people is not happening. There are still over 30,000 families in displaced uh, shelters and living with relatives and uh, their lands are being okay. still occupied by the military. All right, let me uh, bring in Nimi Gauri Nathan, she joins us from New York. She served as the director of the South Asia programs and UN representative for Operation USA and is currently a visiting professor at the Colin Powell Center at City College in New York. Nimi, thanks for joining us. As I mentioned, we were talking to the Sri Lankan ambassador earlier on the show. Um, Sri Lankan armed forces have been accused of some pretty serious human rights atrocities and war crimes uh, allegedly committed during the war. So have Tamil rebels, they've been accused of crimes as well. But among the crimes that Sri Lankan armed forces have been accused of is widespread sexual abuse. What could you tell us about that? Yes, from research done in 2009 as well as last year, um, there was a significant amount of sexual violence by military forces during and after the war, particularly as they had the population within internment camps um, and were in complete control of those areas. At this time, you know, one of the arguments the government will make is that there is less sexual violence coming from the state or from state forces. Um, where I think the magnitude of the crimes has decreased, the mode of operating remains the same. And there has been no recourse and no um, justice for the women who faced all kinds of forms of sexual violence, including forced abortions, including um, gang rapes, those crimes have still not been prosecuted. So for Tamil women living under military occupation, sexual violence remains a constant threat that determines their daily lives. 
Uh, getting back to my earlier point on uh, human rights atrocities and possible war crimes committed, allegedly committed, I should say, by members of the Tamil rebels, um, they've been accused of recruiting children, of using humans as, or rather civilians, as human shields, kidnapping, shooting people who are trying to escape the war zone. Are we going to see accountability on the part of the Tamil forces as well? I think from being in Sri Lanka towards the end of the war, there certainly were credible accusations of crimes committed by the LTT. Unfortunately, in order to see any sort of equitable um, accountability process, you know, a number of the senior Qatar were killed um, in a manner that is, that is a war crime. Um, the rest remain in detention. And so the accountability, on the other hand, would require the significant involvement of the international community, but also an acknowledgement by the state of the crimes they perpetrated against the senior leadership. And as far as we are concerned, uh, um, you know, we are insisting that uh, crimes by every side should be investigated, and that way the, the proportionality of the crimes committed uh, and uh, the severity of those crimes will also uh, come to light. Uh, Elias, you mentioned earlier on that uh, the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council has proposed the adoption of these special hybrid courts. These are courts which are domestic Sri Lankan courts, but will have significant participation by international jurists, and those include judges, lawyers, prosecutors, investigators, etc. Will that be acceptable to the Tamils in Sri Lanka? Do you see that as, uh, as justice? Um, Actually, the, the, uh, the Tamils uh, have demanded for international investigation and not uh, Sri Lanka's uh, domestic investigation because they do not have any faith uh, in Sri Lankan investigation. The Commissioner for Human Rights, Zayed himself, has clearly stated in his report uh, uh, there is no trust in the Sri Lankan um, judiciary. Uh, and the Tamils last year during the resolution time asked for international investigation. But as a compromise, they agreed for a hybrid uh, investigation, hybrid code uh, that will be Sri Lankan based, but it will have a participation from uh, Commonwealth foreign, in essentially its international judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, and investigators. This is very central to the agreement that Tamils also uh, are willing partners of that resolution. But right. what has happened since is that the president of uh, Sri Lanka, Sirisena, has distanced himself from that commitment and he says that uh, it, uh, there will only be a local inquiry over there and no foreign personnel will be involved. And since then, the prime minister, uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe, also has recently told that there won't be any international participation. This okay. is very central for the credibility of this transitional justice process and uh, something the victims are, uh, um, they are unwilling to accept for any pure domestic investigation in this respect. All right, Nimi, thousands of people went missing during this war. Uh, Sri Lanka has now established uh, the Office of Missing Persons uh, to track down, try to trace uh, who these missing people are, what happened to them. Human Rights Watch says that uh, one of the shortcomings of this office is that they're not talking to the families of those people uh, who went missing. The ambassador told us during his interview that they are talking to the families of people who went missing. What, is, uh, what do you know about that? Um, the crisis group recent statement also alluded to the fact that there was not an adequate consultation of victims in the process of the Office of Missing Persons. Um, you know, the way that these sort of procedures and commissions, there's a presidential commission, there are a number of different commissions that have been established, which operate largely around political agendas, right? And that makes the centrality of the victim experience and the accountability for the crimes far less central. Um, in terms of the Office of, of Missing Persons, you know, one of the big concerns, I think, for Tamils and should be for the entire country is whether you're going to see a trade-off between truth and justice. So in order to identify where a missing person is, you would have to identify how they went missing. And if the state is involved, will there be an aspect to this process of criminalization? Will there be an accountability for the forces that were involved in the disappearance or the death of an individual? 
Elias, the ambassador talked about devolved powers in a unified Sri Lanka. Will Tamils be happy with that? Will they be happy with devolved powers, or do they still want an independent state? Power will come, I think, at um, in the areas that are the least important to the Tamils. This will not be an actual devolution of political power to areas where the Tamils have an element of governance over their own lives. If this was a serious commitment by the Sri Lankan government, then you would have already seen a complete demilitarization of these areas. If their desire is to relinquish control of these areas, the majority of Tamils still believe they're living under military occupation. Okay. It will take a major shift to go from military occupation to self-governance. Elias, what is your view on that? Yeah, uh, if I can add to it, uh, the the devolution uh, of power itself is uh, you know is a misleading phrase. What is required is a sharing of power between the Sinhalese and the Tamils, in between the central government uh, and the periphery, and the northern and eastern provinces have been historical habitats uh, for the Tamil people, and it has been acknowledged even by the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord. Uh, where the Indian government signed on behalf of the Tamils uh, uh, merging the northern and eastern provinces. So the, at least the fundamental demand on a political settlement for the Tamils is uh, right now uh, for, in order for them to continue to remain uh, in a united country, not unitary but a united country, is that there has to be a federal form of government where the northern and eastern provinces should be Remerged, uh, and they should have autonomy in those regions. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to both of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.